Hello, I'm Victor Strandberg, continuing our studies in the poetry of T.S. Eliot. In this session, we're going to have a look at T.S. Eliot's conversion experience, and we're going to look at the first poem he published after his conversion, a poem titled Journey of the Magi. We concluded our last session on the Hollow Men with a look at the last two lines displaying the triumph of the naturalistic intellect over the poet's upsurge of religious desire. This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. The whimper referring to the supplication of a dead man's hand, the plea for immortality, a sign of weakness, a refusal to face reality uh, in the perspective that the hollow men concluded with. It turns out that though Eliot could suppress his religious desire in the poem, it was not so easy to suppress it in his actual life. And in the year after the, way the hollow men was published, uh, T.S. Eliot and several relatives uh, took a journey to the city of Rome. And there, as they looked at a picture of Michelangelo's Pieta, showing Mary with her son Jesus crucified in her arms, uh, the two relatives, his sister and brother-in-law, looked around and to their astonishment, there was T.S. Eliot on his knees in front of the picture. In, on, I should say, July, 29th, 1927, T.S. Eliot was formally received into the Anglican Church, uh, was baptized on that occasion, and from that point on, virtually everything he wrote had the purpose of propagating the Christian faith, including his poetry, his plays, uh, and his literary and cultural criticism the exceptions being some minor poems such as his quite delightful cat poetry in his later years. By way of understanding T.S. Eliot's conversion experience, I'm going to turn to a book that T.S. Eliot actually read when he was a student at Harvard. Its title is The Varieties of Religious Experience a classic work on the subject written by a Harvard professor, William James, the brother of Henry James. Now in this book, which T.S. Eliot marked up in the margins in his own copy, in this book, William James considers hundreds of testimonies of people who attest to religious experience, and James limited his research to people who were very accomplished, well-educated, perfectly sane. A number of them were figures of genius. And he analyzed their testimonies to classify their experience according to these varieties of religious experience. Categories such as the healthy-minded, the morbid-minded, the reality of the unseen, the sick soul, mysticism, saintliness, and so forth. Uh, I'm going to begin with William James's category of the sick soul. And when we cite that segment, it will become obvious that T.S. Eliot very definitely belongs in this category. William James says, I'm quoting him now, the purely naturalistic look at life, however enthusiastically it may begin, is sure to end in sadness. This sadness lies at the heart of every merely positivistic, agnostic, or naturalistic scheme of philosophy. Let sanguine healthy-mindedness do its best with its strange power of living in the moment. Still, the skull will grin in at the banquet. The vanity of mortal things, the sense of sin, the fear of the universe, 
certainly three subjects of major importance in Eliot's poetry. In one or another of these three ways, it always is that man's original optimism and self-satisfaction gets leveled with the dust. Now, William James mentions here the healthy-minded, that he aligns against the morbid-minded. These are the two personality types into which he divides the whole human species. The curious thing is that the experiences that one undergoes in life seem to have little to do, necessarily at least, with one's place in one category or the other. William James takes up Tolstoy, for example, as an example of the morbid-minded, and he was a man who had all the advantages of life. He was a Russian count, very high up in the social hierarchy. He was a great genius, a man honored all around the world for his fiction, a celebrated author, certainly. Uh, he had a very good marriage, had healthy children, and yet all he wanted to do was commit suicide. At around the age of 50 or so, he says in his memoirs, that he had to hide his guns and ropes from himself so that he would not perform the act of suicide. Uh, despite all these advantages uh, that he could have enjoyed, now, on the other hand, Walt Whitman is an instance of the healthy-minded, despite a life in which he had a great deal of suffering. Uh, for one thing, he was homosexual, a, an immense stigma at that time in the mid-19th century. Uh, he also was a man whose life work as a poet was treated with utter contempt by the literary establishment. Uh, one critic claimed he has fouled with excrement the doorstep of civilization. And he had terrible problems with his health. Uh, shortly after the Civil War, he suffered a series of strokes that left him partially paralyzed. He ended up in a wheelchair, in fact. He had a great many other very serious ailments by way of his physical condition. And yet, he looked at the world and, and in his poetry uh, declared, what a beautiful world. What a wonderful gift is the gift of life. Now, as we go on in William James's chapter on the sick soul, James describes, quote, the real core of the religious problem, help, help. That is, the religious sensibility is centered on a cry for help. There is no doubt, James goes on to say, that healthy-mindedness is inadequate as a philosophical doctrine because the evil facts which he refutes positively to account for are a genuine portion of reality, and they may, after all, be the best key to life's significance. William James was a member of the morbid-minded category. The completest religions, he says, would therefore seem to be those in which the pessimistic elements are best developed. Buddhism and Christianity are the best known to us of these. They are essentially religions of deliverance. Man must die to an unreal life before he can be born into the real life. Buddhism and Christianity, cited by James, were the two religions that most attracted T.S. Eliot's attention. And the reason James calls them pessimistic is because both Buddhism and Christianity turn their back on this world in favor of the next world, the kingdom of God for Christians and nirvana for Buddhism. The next segment of the varieties of religious experience, which I wish to examine, has the title, The Divided Self and the Process of Its Unification. Uh, it is undeniable from what we've studied 
that T.S. Eliot was a divided self. And such a person, according to James, must be born again in order to be happy. Let me cite what he says in this chapter. The healthy-minded need to be born only once, the natural birth into this beautiful world. The sick souls, by contrast, must be twice born in order to be happy. The process of unification, or being born again, when it occurs may come gradually or may occur abruptly. It may come through altered feelings or through altered powers of action, or it may come through new intellectual insights or through experiences we shall later have to designate as mystical. Now in this volume, The Varieties of Religious Experience, William James declares that his chapter on mysticism is the most crucial chapter from which the significance of all the other religious phenomena uh, is derived. And in his copy of this book, T.S. Eliot also uh, considered mysticism to be the most important chapter. The third and last segment of this volume that I want to cite is from a chapter called Conversion. Here's what William James writes about that. To say a man is converted means that religious ideals previously peripheral in his consciousness now take a central place and that religious aims form the habitual center of his energy. All we know is that there are dead feelings, dead ideas, and cold beliefs, and there are hot and live ones. And when one grows hot and live within us, everything has to recrystallize about it. He goes on to describe his own predicament as someone incapable of conversion, speaking of William James. Some persons never are and possibly never could be converted. They may be excellent persons, but they are lifelong subjects of barrenness and dryness. Such inaptitude for religion may be in some cases be intellectual in its origins, the dangers of education. Their religious faculties may be checked in the natural tendency to expand by beliefs about the world that are inhibitive, the pessimistic and materialistic beliefs, for example, within which so many good souls find themselves nowadays, as it were, frozen. We conclude this segment from the chapter on conversion with James's statement about two ways of coping with the sick soul. The first way is through conversion. There are only two ways in which it is possible to get rid of anger, worry, fear, despair, or other undesirable affections, the sick soul condition. One is that an opposite affection should overpoweringly break over us, conversion. And the other is what I call the black humor response, very common in 20th century literature, in which a character gets so boiled and cooked in tragedy and suffering, that he emerges with a wicked kind of laughter, a defense mechanism against the world's pain, described as follows by William James. The other way to deal with the sick soul condition is by getting so exhausted with the struggle that we have to stop, drop down, give up, and don't care any longer. I conclude this set of citations by turning to Thomas Carlyle in Sartor Rosatis, a single sentence. Faith is the one thing needful. Without it, worldlings, in the midst of plenty, puke up their sick existence. This is a sort of judgment, I think, that Eliot pronounced on himself after his conversion and speaking of his time before his conversion. 
at least he said in several occasions that the poetry he wrote before his conversion seemed to him like poetry written by someone else, not by T.S. Eliot. His conversion was so complete, in other words, in his own estimate, that he really had become a new man. He had been born again to an entirely new identity, unconnected to his earlier identity as a hollow man. We move now to the poem, Journey of the Magi, published in 1927, the same year as his conversion. And it is a monologue delivered by one of these magi, uh, the three kings or wise men that we see on Christmas cards coming across the desert to find the Christ child. Eliot himself, of course, is using this figure as a persona for his own trip across a desert to find the Christ child and describing it as a difficult journey. The voice of the Magus then as we begin this poem, a cold coming we had of it, just the worst time of year, the ways deep and the weather sharp, the very dead of winter. And we do think of Christmas as in the dead of winter. The camels galled, sore-footed, lying down in the melting snow. There were times we regretted the summer palaces on slopes, the terraces and the silken girls bringing sherbet. This is a description of the temptation to stop the journey, to simply sit back and enjoy the world's pleasures and comforts, which is the recourse of many 20th century writers to celebrate the pleasures, the satisfactions of the world, and why go further than that. T.S. Eliot and the Magus do go further across the desert uh, to the point where we reach the greatest difficulty of T.S. Eliot's conversion, the response of his companions here in the voice of the Magus, with the voices singing in our ears, saying that this was all folly. Now, among the responses of T.S. Eliot's companions, the voice of Ezra Pound, I think, was especially significant. T.S. Eliot's mentor, the man who edited out half of the wasteland and made it incomparably better thereby, who wrote in his cantos, tell Possum, that's Pound's nickname for Eliot, tell Possum with a bang, not a whimper, with a bang, not a whimper. Pound, of course, felt that Eliot had chickened out. He was whimpering. He had turned to the bosom of the Church of England for protection from actual naturalistic reality. Voices singing in our ears saying that this was all folly. The poem continues uh, describing the journey of the Magus and of Eliot. And we do note some clearly Christian symbolism coming into the poem. At dawn, we came down to a temperate valley with a running stream and three trees on the low sky. Six hands at an open door dicing for pieces of silver, feet kicking the empty wineskins. As we conclude, the Magus, now an old man, thinks back, trying to sift out the meaning of that journey. All this was a long time ago, I remember, and I would do it again. But set down this, set down this, where we led all that way for birth or death, capital B, capital D, the birth and death of Jesus. There was a birth, capital B, of Jesus, certainly, we had evidence and no doubt. Uh, this birth, capital B, Jesus' birth, was hard and bitter agony for us, like death, capital D, Jesus' death. And then he adds our death with a small d. We return to our places, but no longer at ease here in the old dispensation. 
with an alien people clutching their gods. T.S. Eliot, after his conversion, felt that he was living in a pagan society. And that's why he directed the great bulk of his work towards propagating the Christian faith in what he considered one of the dark ages. I should be glad of another death, he says, to conclude this poem. And this is a posture we'll see elsewhere in Eliot, a man who is eager to dispense with what's left of his life in the wasteland and to go directly to the next world, waiting for the end somewhat impatiently. I should be glad of another death. We'll leave it there for now, and in our next and final lecture, we'll take up the major poem about T.S. Eliot's con conversion, Ash Wednesday. <clears throat>